Welcome to Fortune Forecast. I am Daisy, your hostess, and you are joining me as we go through the book titled The Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. It was published in 1921 and it is in the public domain. It was published by the Payne Book Company in Chicago. If you're new to my channel, welcome. And to our Fortune community, welcome back. As I've mentioned in other videos, if you would like to catch the full book, please go to my book playlist where you will find all the chapters there under its playlist titled The Book of Life. If you are ready to go on to the next chapter and skip my narrator's comment, please open the description and click on the timestamp and it will take you right there. Jumping right into my thoughts on the last previous chapters where we talked about myself and my neighbor and also the mind and the body. And as this is a first time read for me, I was already looking through the bigger picture as I was heading into this chapter previously where I was very tickled that the author himself came to that point where he quoted, our duty toward God is our duty to make of ourselves the most perfect product of the divine incarnation that we can become. Our duty to our neighbor is to help him to do the same. I seem to resonate with that better than some of the other things that he did mention. Where does this leave room for those that maybe have no uh, connection with the idea of a God or maybe with the idea of uh, a more scientific approach? It comes back down to the person and what does that look like moving forward? In what sense can we help the human race continue on its path? Because there is a sense of it's infinite. Infinite not in the sense of the human life, the one human life, but infinite in the sense of the human race and its evolution. I believe that when we're armed with that point of view, it takes us away from our one life to our collective life. And it is more about myself becoming a better person, not for myself alone, but for what I can do and how I can impact those around me. Especially as we go through the next chapter where he does mention the law of cause and effect. And having said that, I'd like to kind of go back and talk about where he said uh, that our bodies are part of the material universe and subject to the laws or ways of being of this universe. And he was very bold in even talking about the biochemistry, the advancements of science and how in biochemistry we're now at a place where we know what kind of gases can make us cry. We know what kind of gases can make us laugh. And while it may have seemed to be a lighthearted joke of his to say, well, could you imagine if there was a gas that can be created that can sway the elections? Uh, I don't think that was too funny, but imagine if we manipulate and we know, if we know where to put a little needle that it could actually take a muscle and just turn it off. That's a lot of knowledge that science has in understanding man and how predictable the physical body is and almost scary if you start thinking about that yet what about the mind when he goes on to talk about the examples that someone can come in with some type of whether it's spiritual mental psychology that can help a person go from a place of not feeling well to all of a sudden having a full re restoration of their body by changing the way that that person thinks. And when that person thinks a different way, well, guess what? They've changed the chemistry in their body as well. And that's proven in today's science. I'd like to share a conversation that I had with my mother in regards to the law of cause and effect. And it it resonates a lot with this previous chapter about mind and body, specifically when he was talking about 
the law of conservation of energy, and also the law of cause and effect. So this experience or this conversation between my mother and I will seem to kind of bring this together in the way that I appreciated what the author was bringing out in this last chapter. So my mother was talking about the decisions that she made when she told my father, yes, that she will marry him. And I told my mother, well, mom, I want to say thank you for that decision. Had you not made that decision, then Jordan, my son, would not be here now as an instrument to bring music and the love of music to the next generation. For that one day when I got a call that there was a lady giving birth at a supermarket and I was there to be helpful in bringing this new life. Or later on when I became mayor to a small city in Florida and all the decisions that were made during those four years that may have improved the quality of life for people in my city, whether it was through saving taxes or voting yes to an annexation that in the future may bring employment to the area and all the other people that will be affected by that decision because my mother said, yes, I will marry you. Think about it, how the impact is of that one life of a one decision we can go that far each one of us can be grateful and thankful for the i do's of people that came before us i know that's a little bit deep but i wanted to share that with you if you are ready if you haven't done so hey hit that like button and subscribe to my channel if you want also hit the bell that way you'll get notified when i put up future videos if you are ready I am ready. Let's move on now to chapter 12. While chapter 11 was titled The Mind and the Body, we start with chapter 12 titled The Mind of the Body. Discusses the subconscious mind and what it is, what it does to the body, and how it can be controlled and made use of by the intelligence. The importance of the mind in matters of health becomes clearer when we understand that what we commonly call our minds, the mental states which control us day by day in our consciousness, are really but a small portion of our total mind. In addition to this conscious mind, there is an enormous mass of our personality, which is like a storehouse attached to our dwelling a place to which we do not often go, but to which we can go in case of need. This storehouse is our memory, the things we know and can recall at will. And then there is another, still vaster storehouse. No one has ever measured or guessed the size of it, which apparently contains everything that we have ever known, perhaps also everything that our ancestors have known. A common simile for the human mind is that of an iceberg. A certain portion of it appears above the surface of the sea, but there is seven times as much of it floating out of sight under the water. This subconscious mind seems to be the portion most closely united with the body. It has its seat in the back parts of the brain, in the spinal cord, and the greater nervous ganglia, such as the solar plexus. It is the portion of our mind which controls the activities of our body. All those miraculous things which went out before we first opened our eyes to the light and which go on while we sleep and never cease until we die. When we cut our finger and admit foreign germs to our blood, some mysterious power causes millions of our blood corpuscles to be rushed to this spot to destroy and devour the invading enemy. We do not know how this is done, but it is an intelligent act, measured and precisely regulated, as much so as a railroad timetable. When the supply of nourishment in the body becomes low, something issues a notice by way of our stomach, which we call hunger, 
when we take food into the stomach, something pours out the gastric juice to digest it. When this digested food is prepared and taken up in the bloodstream, something decides what portion of it shall be turned into muscle, what into brain cells, what into hair, what into fingernails. Sometimes, of course, mistakes are made and we have diseases. But for the most part, all this infinitely intricate process goes on day and night without a hitch. And it is all the work of what we might call the mind of the body. And just as our material bodies are the product of an age-long process of development repeated in embryo by every individual, so is this mental life a product of long development and carries memories of this far-off process. In our instincts there dwells all the past, not merely of the human race, but of all life. And if we should ever succeed in completely probing the subconscious mind and bringing it into our consciousness, it would be the same as if we were free to ramble about in all the past. Huxley set forth the fact that all the history of evolution is told in a piece of chalk. And we probably do not exaggerate in saying that all the history of the universe is in the subconscious mind of every human being. When the partridge which has just come out of the egg sees the shadow of the hawk flip by and crouches motionless as a leaf, the partridge is not acting upon any knowledge which it has acquired in the few minutes since it was hatched. It is acting upon a knowledge impressed upon its subconscious mind by the experience of millions of partridges, perhaps for tens of thousands of years. When the physician lifts the newly born infant by its ankle and spanks it to make it cry, the physician is using his conscious reason because he has learned from previous experience or has been taught in the schools that it is necessary for the child's breathing apparatus to be instantly cleared. But when the child responds to the spanking with a yell, it is not moved by reason indignation at an undeserved injury. It is following an automatic reaction as a result of the experience of infants in the Stone Age, experience which in some obscure way has been registered and stored in the infant cerebellum. Science is now groping its way through this underworld of thought. Obviously, we should have here a most powerful means of influencing the body if by any chance we could control it. We are continually seeking in medical and surgical ways to stimulate or to retard activities of the body which are controlled entirely by this subconscious mind. If we are suffering intense pain in a joint, we put on a mustard plaster, what we call a counter irritant, to trouble the skin and draw the congested blood away from the place of the pain. On the other hand, we may stimulate the functions of the intestines by the application of hot formations to bring the blood more actively to that region. But if by any means we could make clear our wishes to the subconscious mind, we should be dealing with headquarters and should get quicker and more permanent results. Can we by any possibility do this? To begin with, let me tell you of a simple experiment that I have witnessed. I once knew a man who had learned to control the circulation of his blood by his conscious will. I have seen him lay his two hands on the table, both of the same color, and without moving the hands, cause one hand to turn red and the other to turn pale. And obviously, so far as this man is concerned, the problem of counter irritants had been resolved. He is a mental mustard plaster. And what was done by this man's own will can be done to others in many ways. The most obvious is a device which we call hypnotism. This is a kind of sleep which affects only the conscious control of the body, but leaves all the senses awake. 
In this hypnotic sleep or trance, we discover that the subconscious mind is a good deal like a Henry Dub of the socialist cartoons. It is faithful and persistent, very strong in its own limited field, but comically credulous, willing to believe anything that is told it, and to take orders from anyone who climbs into the seat of authority. You have perhaps attended one of the exhibitions which traveling hypnotists are accustomed to give in country villages. You have seen some bumpkin brought up on the stage and hypnotized and told that he is in the water and must swim for his life, or that he is in the midst of the hornet's nest, or that his trousers are torn in the seat, any comical thing that will cause an audience to howl with laughter. These facts were discovered nearly 150 years ago by a French doctor named Mesmer. He was a good deal of a charlatan and would not reveal his secrets, and probably the scientific men of that time were glad to despise him because what he did was so new and strange. There is a certain type of scientific mind which sits aloft on a throne with a framed diploma above its head and says that what it knows is science and what it does not know is nonsense. And so mesmerism was left for the quacks and traveling showmen. But half a century later, a French physician named Le Bault took up this method of hypnotism without all the fakery that had been attached to it. He experimented and discovered that he could cure not merely phobias and manias, fixed ideas, hysterias, and melancholias. He could cure definite physical diseases of the physical body, such as headache, rheumatism, and hemorrhage. Later on, two other physicians, Janet and Sharkut, developed definite schools of psychotherapy. They rejected hypnotism as, in most cases, too dangerous, but used a milder form which is known as hypnoidization. You would be surprised to know how many ailments which baffle the skill of medical men and surgeons yield completely to a single brief treatment by such a mental specialist. All that is necessary is some method to tap the subconscious mind. In many cases, the subconsciousness knows what is the matter and will tell at once a secret that is completely hidden from the consciousness. For example, a man's hands shake. They have been shaking for years and he has no idea why, but his subconscious mind explains that they first began to shake with grief over the death of his wife. Also, the subconscious mind meekly and instantly accepts the suggestion that the time for grief is past and that the hands will never shake again. Or, here is a woman who has become convinced that worms are crawling all over her. Everything that touches her becomes a worm. Even the wrinkles in her dress are worms. And she is wild with nervousness and, of course, is on the way to the lunatic asylum. She is hypnotized and sees the operator catching these worms one by one and killing them. She is told that he has killed the last, but she insists, no, there is one more. The operator clutches that one and she is perfectly satisfied and completely cured. Her husband writes, expressing his relief that he no longer has to sleep every night in a fish pond. This instance with many others and told by Professor Quackenbos in his book, Hypnotic Therapeutics. Among the most powerful means to influence the subconscious personality is religious excitement. Religion has come down to us from ancient times and its fears and ecstasies are a part of our instinctive endowment. Those who can sway religious emotions can cure disease, not merely fixed ideas, but many diseases which appear to be entirely physical, but which psychoanalysis reveals to be hysterical in nature. Of course, these religious persons who heal by laying on of hands or by purely mental means deny indignantly that they are using hypnotism or anything like it. I am aware that I shall bring upon myself a flood of letters from Christian scientists if I identify their methods of curing with animal magnetism and manipulation and other devices of the devil which they repudiate. 
All I can say is that their miracles are brought about by affecting the subconscious mind. There is no other way to bring them about, and for my part I cannot see that it makes a great difference whether the subconscious mind is affected by a hand laid on the forehead, or by a hand waved in the air, or by an incantation pronounced, or by a prayer thought in silence. If you can persuade the subconscious mind that God is operating upon it, that God is omnipotent and is directing this particular healing, that is the most powerful suggestion imaginable and is the basis of many cures. But if in order to achieve this, it is necessary for me to persuade myself that I can find some meaning in the metaphysical moonshine of Mother Eddie, why then, I am very sorry, but I really prefer to remain sick. But such is not the case. You do not have to believe anything that is not true. You simply have to understand the machinery of the subconscious and how to operate it. We are only beginning to acquire that knowledge and we need an open mind free both from the dogmatism of the medical men and the fanaticism of the faith curists. A few years ago in London, I met a number of people who were experimenting in an entirely open-minded way with mental healing, and I was interested in their ideas. I happened to be traveling on the very continent, and on the train my wife was seized by a very dreadful headache. She was lying with her head in my lap, suffering acutely, and I thought I would try an experiment. So I put my hand upon her forehead without telling her what I was doing, and concentrated my attention with the greatest possible intensity upon her headache. I had an idea of the cause of it. I understood that headaches are caused by the irritation of the sensory nerves of the brain by fatigue poisons or other waste matter which the blood has not been able to eliminate. I formed in my mind a vivid picture of what the blood would have to do to relieve that headache, and I concentrated my mental energies upon the command to her subconscious mind that it should perform these particular functions. In a few minutes, my wife sat up with a look of great surprise on her face and said, Why, my headache is gone. It went all at once. That, of course, might have been a coincidence. But I tried the experiment many times, and it happened over and over. On another occasion, I was able to cure the pain of an ulcerated tooth. I was able to cure it half a dozen times, but never permanently. It always returned, and finally the tooth had to come out. My wife experimented with me in the same way, and found that she was able to cure an attack of dyspepsia. But, curiously enough, she at once gave herself a case of dyspepsia something she had never known in her life before. So now I will not allow her to experiment with me, and she will not allow me to experiment with her. But we are quite sure that people with psychic gifts can definitely affect the subconscious mind of others by purely mental means. We are prepared to believe in the miracles of the New Testament and in the wonders of Lourdes, as well as in the healings of the Christian scientists and the New Thoughters which cannot be disputed by anyone who is willing to take the trouble to investigate. We can face these facts without losing our reason, without ceasing to believe that everything in life has a cause, and that we can find out this cause if we investigate thoroughly. End of chapter 12. Stay with me, I will go ahead and proceed over to chapter 13. If you can indulge and help me trigger the laws of cause and effect, hit that like button, share this channel with your family and friends, and get ready. Let's move on to chapter 13, Exploring the Subconscious. Discusses automatic writing, the analysis of dreams, and other methods by which a whole new universe of life has been brought to human knowledge. One of the most common methods of exploring the subconscious mind is the method of automatic writing. I have never tried this myself, but tens of thousands of people are sitting every night with a Ouija in front of them, 
holding a pencil on a piece of paper and letting their subconscious minds write what they please. Most of them are hoping to get messages from the dead, a problem which we shall discuss in the next chapter. Suffice it from the moment to say that automatic writing and table wrapping and other devices of mediumship have opened up to us a vast mass of subconscious mentality. A part of the scientific world still takes a contemptuous attitude and calls this all humbug, but many of our greatest scientists have been persuaded to investigate and have become convinced that in this mass of subconsciousness there is mingled not merely the mind of the medium, but the minds of all those present and possibly other minds as well. For my part, I do not see how anyone can study disinterestedly the proceedings of the Society for Physical Research and not become convinced that telepathy at least is one of the powers of the subconscious mind. Telepathy is what is popularly known as thought transmission. Everyone must know people who are what is called psychic and will know what is happening to some friend in another part of the world or will go upstairs because they sense that someone wants them or will go to the door because they have a hunch that someone is coming. And maybe these things are only chance, but you will be unscientific if you do not take the trouble to read and learn what modern investigators have brought out on such subjects. This much is certain and is denied by no competent investigator. Whatever has been in your mind is still there and it is possible to find a way of tapping the buried memory. An old woman, delirious with fever, begins to babble in a strange language, and it is discovered that she is talking ancient Hebrew. The woman is entirely illiterate, and her conscious memory knows no language but her own. Her conscious mind has no ideas beyond those of her domestic life and the gossip of the village. But investigation is made, and it is discovered that when this woman was a girl, she worked in the home of a Hebrew scholar and heard him reading aloud. She did not understand a word of what she heard and was not consciously listening to it. Nevertheless, every syllable of it had been stored away forever by her subconscious mind. Innumerable cases of this sort have been established, and as a matter of fact, we might have been prepared for such discoveries by the memory feats of the conscious mind. It is well known that Mozart, when a child, could listen to a new opera and go home and play it over note for note. At present, there is a child in America giving exhibitions in public, carrying on 30 games of chess at the same time. There have been others who do sums of mental arithmetic, such as multiply 32 figures by 32 figures, or reciting the Bible backwards. All this seems incredible. And yet there is something still more incredible. Suppose that these same powers, which are stored in our subconscious mind, were stored also in the minds of animals. A few years ago, Maurice Maeterlinck published a book, The Unknown Guest, in the course of which he tells about his experiments with the so-called Eberfield horses two animals which had been trained for years by their owner to give signals by moving their forefeet and which apparently could count and divide and multiply large sums, and extract square and cube root and spell out names and recognize sounds, scents and colors, and read time from the face of a watch. Of course, it is easy to say that this is absurd, that the horses must have got some signals from their trainer, but as it happened, they would do their work in the absence of their trainer. They would do it in the dark or with a sack over their heads. And the best scientific minds of Germany were unable to suggest any test conditions which could not be met. There have been many gigantic frauds in the world and this may have been one of them. On the other hand, there have been many new discoveries and for my part, I will finish exploring the miracles of the subconscious mind of man before I presume to say that anything is impossible in the subconscious mind of a horse or a dog. 
Also, I will wait for some learned person to explain to me how the subconscious minds of horses and dogs know enough to build and repair their bones and teeth, so cleverly that modern architectural and engineering science could teach them nothing. I ask also if it is possible to find a region in the subconsciousness which is common to two people. Why is it absurd to suggest that there might be a region common to a man and a horse? Why is this any more absurd than they should eat the same food and breathe the same air and feel the same affection and be frightened at the same dangers? The only persons who will be dogmatic about such subjects are the persons who are ignorant. Those who take the trouble to investigate discover more wonderful things every day and they realize that we have here a whole universe of knowledge to which we have as yet barely opened the doors. Consider for example the facts which we are acquiring on the subject of personality and what it means. You would say perhaps that if there is anything you know positively it is that you are one person and have never been anybody else and that your body belongs to you and that nobody else ever has used or ever can use it. But what would you say if I told you that tomorrow you might cease to be and somebody else might be in possession of your body, walking it around and wearing its clothes and spending its money? What if I were to tell you that there might be in you or in your body, half a dozen different personalities, which you have never known or dreamed of, and that tomorrow there might break out a war between them and you, as to which of the half dozen people should hear with your ears and speak with your tongue and walk about with your clothes on. Unless you're familiar with the literature of multiple personality, you would surely say that this was unbelievable, quite as much so as a mathematical horse. Let us begin with the case of the Reverend Anselborn, who was many years ago a perfectly respectable clergyman in a Rhode Island town. One day he disappeared and his family did not hear of him. A year or two later there was a storekeeper in a town in Pennsylvania who suddenly came to himself as the Reverend Anselborn, not knowing what he had been in the meantime or how he came to be keeping a store. Under hypnotism, it developed that he had in him two personalities, and his trance personality recollected all that had been happening in the meantime and told about it freely. Or take the still more fascinating case of the young lady who is known in the literature of psychotherapy as Miss Beauchamp. Her story is told in a book, the Disassociation of a Personality by Dr. Morton Prince of Boston. Some 30 years ago, Miss Beauchamp, a very conscientious and dignified young lady, became nervous and ill and took to doing strange things, which were a source of shame and humiliation to her. Under hypnotism, it was discovered to be a case of multiple personality. The other personality, who finally gave herself the name of Sally, was entirely different in character from Miss Beauchamp, being mischievous, vain, and primitive as a child. She conceived an intense dislike for Miss Beauchamp, whom she called by abusive names. At times when she could get possession of Miss Beauchamp's body, she delighted in playing humiliating tricks upon her enemy, spending her money, running her into debt, breaking her engagements disgracing her before her friends. Sally was always well and Miss Beauchamp was always ill, and Sally would take the body, for which they fought for possession, and take it for long and exhausting walks, and leave it cold and miserable, lost and penniless, in the possession of Miss Beauchamp. And of course, this made Miss Beauchamp more and more a wreck, and Sally took possession of more and more of her time, Sally knew everything that Miss Beauchamp did and thought, but Miss Beauchamp did not know about Sally. She only knew that there were gaps in her life, during which she did things she could not explain. And because she did not want her friends to think her insane, she would try to hide this dreadful condition of affairs, but Sally would spoil her plans by writing letters to her friends, and also by writing insulting letters for Miss Beauchamp to find when she took possession again. 
Then one day, after several years of treatment, there appeared yet another personality, who knew nothing about Miss Beauchamp or Sally either, and only knew what Miss Beauchamp had known up to some years before. Miss Beauchamp had a college education and wrote and spoke French. Sally knew no French and tried in vain to learn it. The new personality did not have a college education at all. Nevertheless, after long experiment, the story of which is as fascinating as any novel you ever read, Dr. Prince discovered that this was the real Miss Beauchamp. The others were split off personalities. He traced the cause to a severe mental shock and succeeded in the end in combining the first Miss Beauchamp with the last and in suppressing the obstinate and wanton Sally. As you read this story, you watch him mentally murdering a human being. Sally clamors pitifully for life, but he condemns her to death and relentlessly executes his sentence. It is a movie thriller with a happy ending, and I should think it would make disconcerting reading to persons who believe that each of us is one immortal soul, or has one immortal soul, and is responsible for it to a personal God. There is never any end to the problems of these multiple personalities, and each case is a test of the judgment and ingenuity of the specialist. He will try to make one personality stick and will fail and will have to accept another or a combination of two. In one case, he found that he could not get the right personality to stick except under hypnosis. So he decided to leave the man in a mild state of trance and the new personality lived all the rest of his life in that condition. If you wish to know more about this subject, you can find books in any well-equipped library. I mention one. The Riddle of Personality by H. Addington Bruce, because it contains in the appendix an excellent list of the literature of the subconscious in all its many aspects. There is another and most fascinating method of exploring this underworld of the mind, and that is the study of dreams. Some 15 years ago, a psychotherapist in New York told me about the discoveries of a physician in Vienna and gave me some pamphlets written in very difficult and technical German. Since then, this Professor Freud has been translated and has become a fad, and the absurdities of his followers make one a little apologetic for him. But we do not give up Jesus because of the torturers and bigots who call themselves Christians, and in the same way, we have no right to blame Freud for all the absurdities of the psychoanalysts. Probably there never was a time in human history when there were not people who interpreted dreams. And you can still buy dream books for 25 cents and learn that a white horse means that you are going to get a letter from your sweetheart tomorrow. Then you can buy another dream book telling you that a white horse means there is going to be a death in your family within the year. Naturally, this prejudices thinking people against dreams analysis, yet dreams are facts, and every fact has its cause. And if you dream about a white horse, there must assuredly be some reason for your dreaming this particular thing. Of course, we know that if you eat mince pie and Welsh rabbit at midnight, you will dream about something terrible. But will it be snakes? Or will it be a railroad rack? Or will it be white horses trampling over you? Obviously, it may be a million different unpleasant things. And what is it that picks out this or that from the infinite store of your memory and brings it into the region of half-consciousness which we call the dream? Professor Freud's discovery is, in brief, that the dream is a wish fulfillment. Our instincts present to our consciousness a great mass of impulses and desires, and among these the consciousness selects what it pleases and represses and refuses to recognize or to act upon the others. But maybe these decisions are not altogether satisfactory to the subconsciousness. The mind of the body is in rebellion against the mind, 
shall we say of reason or shall we say of society? The mind of society, otherwise known as the moral law, says that you shall be a good little boy and shall go to school and learn what you are told and on Sunday go to church and sit very still through a long sermon. Whereas the body of a boy would rather be a savage hunting birds' nests and scalping enemies and exploring magic caves full of precious jewels. So the subconsciousness of the boy, balked and miserable, awaits its time and finds its satisfaction when the boy is asleep and his moral censor has relaxed its control. This dream mind is not a logical and orderly thing like the conscious mind. It is not businesslike and civilized. It does not deal in abstractions. It is far more interested in things than in words. It does not present us with formulas, but with pictures and with stories of weird and wonderful happenings. It is like the mind of the race, which we study in legends and religions. It does not tell us that the sun is a mass of incandescent hydrogen gas, so and so many miles in diameter. It tells us that the sun is a cosmic hero who slays the black dragon of night. So the mind of our body presents us with innumerable pictures and symbols, exactly such as we find in poetry. There may be, and frequently is, dispute as to just what a poet meant by this or that particular image. But if we read all the work of any particular poet, we get a certain impression of that poet's individuality. If he is always talking about the perfume of women's hair and the gleam of the white flesh of nymphs in the thickets, we are not left in doubt as to what is wrong with this poet. And just so, when the expert sets to work to examine all the dreams that any one person can remember day after day, sooner or later the expert observes that these dreams hover continually about one particular subject, and by questioning the person, he can find out what is the secret which is troubling the person, perhaps without the person himself being aware of it. Of course, there are many people who like nothing so much as to talk about themselves, and many are spending their time and their money on the latest fad of being psyched, who would, in any properly organized world, be put to work at hoeing weeds or washing their own clothes. Nevertheless, it is a fact that there are real mental disorders in the world, and innumerable honest and earnest people who have something the matter with them which they do not understand. Here is one way by which the conscientious investigator can find out what the trouble is and make it clear to them and by establishing harmony between their conscience and their subconscious minds can many times put them in the way of health and happiness. Through psychoanalysis we are enabled to understand the split personality and its cause. We discover that almost everyone has more or less rudimentary forms of multiple personality hidden within him, made out of desires and traits which he does not like or which the world forces him to drive into the deeps of his being. These may be evil impulses of sex or violence, they may be the most noble altruisms or artistic yearnings, ridiculous things in a world of hustle. A quite normal man or woman may keep a separate self, apart from the world, living a Jekyll life of business propriety and a Hyde life of religious or musical ecstasy. Or again, the repressed impulses may integrate themselves in the unconscious and you may have genius or lunacy or both. Great wits to madness near allied. The modern knowledge on such dark mysteries you may find in Hearts, the Psychology of Insanity. End of chapter 13. Before you move on to the next video where I will be there with chapter 14, please do hit that like button 
and subscribe to the channel.